Good evening, Twitch. Hello, YouTube. Welcome to Birth of a World. How's everyone doing tonight? It's good to be back. Uh, some of you might be wondering why I've missed two weeks of videos. Um, I had laryngitis and I couldn't talk. Uh, so I couldn't really do these where I talk into a webcam for uh, a couple, for a, an hour or so. But uh, my throat has healed now, so I'm back, and hopefully this will be a, the start of another uninterrupted run of uh, Birth of a World episodes. So I want to get back to talking about the campaign story that we're trying to build. Uh, we kind of took a few digressions uh, over back in January, uh, talking about you know kind of specific side topics uh, related to DMing things like well like the ad libbing video I did uh, a couple weeks ago now before I got sick. I want to get back to actually working on this the specific storyline that we started working on. So for anyone who's had, doesn't remember what how what we were doing back in, I guess, no, December, November time frame now, we're working on building a storyline for a new D&D &D campaign. Uh, I still hope to live play this campaign in front of people at some point, but I want to get through kind of the current stuff I've got going first before that happens. But in the meantime, uh, we, we can still be outlining the things that are going to happen uh, to kind of set up some direction to go with this. So where we were last time... Where we're up to so far, right? We had the player characters. They had their kind of starting adventure. Um, and then we handed them this main storyline where uh, there is a set of magic mirrors that they accidentally activate. The magic mirrors are causing bits of other planes to leak through uh, into the prime material plane. And now they these are letting... Um, they have just... Where, where they'll be in the storyline for what we're working on next... Um, they'll have just encountered kind of the first hint of the effects of this. They don't know for sure what's going on yet. Uh, what they know is when they went into the country of Kazal, uh, specifically to the city of Rasta here, they uh, heard news that a, there was apparently a berserk angel attacking uh, a village in the desert called Nassar. Uh, and so the, the party uh, are kind of handed a plot hook and expected to go uh, to want to go out and check this out. Um, obviously it's possible that they'll just want to go a completely separate direction, but this is you, this should be too interesting to pass up uh, for for most parties, and that's kind of what we're what we're getting for here. So this is our plot hook. There's an angel that's gone berserk. Uh, when they go to Nassar, they have a boss fight um, with this angel, which we, we talked about, but during the battle uh, the players will receive a psychic message, a vision uh, presumably from the angel, but that's not not, speci not necessarily specific. Uh, and it details it, it's going to con we have to convey to them with the psychic message what will hap what is happening as far as the magic mirrors go, and what will likely happen if things are allowed to continue unchecked. So tonight's birth of a world, we're going to be talking about visions and prophecies and coming up with a a prophetic vision uh, to give to our player characters. Um, if you are following along on YouTube, this link will be in the video description. If you're on Twitch, here you go. Here's a link to the notes. Um, please share that with anyone new who joins the show. Um, and again, for anyone who's new to the new to the show on Twitch. Uh, this is an interactive podcast. Feel free to ask questions and make suggestions. I'll also try and ask chat uh, for suggestions from time to time. People who are watching on YouTube, hey, get in there and comment if it if uh, I do read the comments if they're if you make comments. So uh, we have some important information we need to get through. So when we're, we're talking about uh, uh, giving a vision for story purposes, obviously it has to convey a specific piece of information, right, um, in a kind of vague and hazy way. So what do we definitely need to get across to the player characters? Uh, and here I am doing my own style bullets again. Um, so what do we need to get across? Um, there are a number of magic mirrors. They look like the one.
Uh, they look like the magic. The they look like the first mirror. This is important because we have to kind of draw this association. Um, uh, uh, the mirrors let uh, stuff from the other planes get through. This is again kind of critically important uh, bits of information that we have to get across, right, is that's why there's this angel going berserk attacking townspeople. Um, I guess the other thing is um, uh, this one might not be crucial. Uh, might also be kind of, I think that's going to be probably hard to convey, so maybe uh, conveying that the creatures brought through the mirrors are confused or crazy. Uh, I think we're demonstrating that pretty well with this berserk angel that refuses to listen to reason. Um, you know, a normally lawful good type creature that's just gone on a rampage attacking presumably neutral or good townsfolk. Um, so I'll move that one down a bit. Uh, what else do we need to convey with this information? I guess that's really the big thing. Um, oh yeah. This is where the, the peril of the world comes in, right? You have to save the world by uh, stopping these this magic mirror kind of cascade effect that's going on. Um, so I'll just keep a note here that... Uh, other information is, you know, the creatures brought through are insane. Um, Um, what, else, what other information do we need to convey? Hey, it looks like we got someone else just joined. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so that's really the, the information we need to convey. Now, visions and prophecies. So that, let's let's talk a bit, a bit about kind of the prophecy tropes here. Um, what are some of the most important bits about a prophecy, apart from the fact that it gives information to players or to to characters? What are, what are the important bits? And I'll get out there with the first one while I wait for the Twitch to catch up. Um, they're vague uh, and subject to personal interpretation. <coughs> Other suggestions from Twitch chat, if you've got them. Uh, otherwise, I'll just keep going here. Another good, another good uh, prophecy trope kind of is the the hidden meaning. The fact that you know you say, the prophecy says one thing very explicitly. Uh, it's a good example. Having a, I'm just blanking on good prophecies right now, but you know it'll say it'll say. So and so uh, is going to, die on this given day at this given. Oh, I know a good one. Um, if you go to Zaha Doom, you will die. Right. Babylon 5, prophecy, very, very explicit. Go to place, killed. Okay. Um, and I mean, that's definitely, uh, you know, it's a very explicit prophecy in this case, but at the same time, we if, so spoilers, um, Babylon 5 spoilers, if anyone hasn't watched it, it's a fantastic show, but uh, goes to Zahadum, does indeed die for like a, a fraction of a second, and then he gets uh, resurrected. Um, so true, but not the point necessarily. Um, I don't know, I guess that's not a great example because he did actually die. Uh, I don't know. Um, Leinart suggesting they can come at any time. Which is true. Generally speaking, prophecies can, you know, be delivered from an unexpected, an unexpected time and place. 
Um, certainly, I think at a fight in the middle of a small town in the desert uh, is probably an unexpe the, not what the player characters would be expecting when it comes to them. Um, so let's uh, let's talk a bit about also DMing specifically for a prophecy. Uh, there's a few considerations you have to make, right? Uh, we have to consider, you know, uh, so we got like uh, you you don't you want to discourage metagaming, obviously, but the truth is you're going to want to construct any kind of prophecy you give um, to fit your players' kind of backgrounds if they're really you know well versed in philosophy. Uh, they're not going. They're, they're going to be more keen on actually figuring out. Um, they're, they're more likely to actually kind of piece this together or see referencing something. My camera is a bit messed up. Oh. Um, so you kind of want to, want to think about that. I'm lucky enough that I don't have any serious philosophers in my the group that I'm making this campaign for, uh, so I don't have to worry too much about that one. Uh, that's a good. So so you know. Um, Uh, world unveiling, I guess. Right, we're dealing with a campaign, any new world. You know, this is not the Forgotten Realms. Not everyone knows where, where all the major locations are, things like that. So you're going to be likely, when you tell your story, unveiling additional parts of the world, bits that you, the player characters, the players themselves have not encountered yet, uh, even if their characters have. So you need to kind of set it up to either really glaze over these locations or make it clear so that you know they can make their knowledge geography check or whatever and see okay this is what I saw was over there somewhere um, which also makes a nice kind of hinting at loca about loca future locations so I got a bit of hiccups there um, other things to consider uh, oh yeah, here's the really important one. Who gets the prophecy? This is kind of a big deal uh, for player characters, especially if you've got... Uh, it, it's cre it creates asymmetry in amongst the party, right? Does everyone get it? Does everyone get it the same way? Uh, do you, do, when you give the prophecy to someone, do you just stand there and say at the table, "Okay, you all experience, you know, uh, this. You all experience th these visions, this scene, this this stuff that you experience. Uh, you all experience it, and you all experience it the exact same way." Or do, does one per does maybe one character get it? And the the, the, cla the example, would, the probably prime candidate for that would be the priest or religious figure. Um, you know, many religions have prophets. That's a that's a thing that's pretty common. Um, so you'd have your your priest character then you know have to interpret this vision in the context uh, of their faith potentially if they're role playing it very well. Um, um, now. The other option is giving the prophecy to a player character who does not have the mental faculties to truly make sense of what the message contains. Uh, th now, this is this is an interesting one. I think this is probably the most interesting situation for role play, is when you give the prophecy not to the wizard who could recognize locations. Uh, when you when you give the prophecy not to a wizard who could recognize locations off the, at the drop of a hat. Or to the priest who could say, oh, it's a message from my deity. He wants us to go do this thing and use that to justify whatever he feels like. But you give it to, like, the idiot barbarian or something like that, right, who uh, you're going to tell the player it. You're going to describe it, you know, to that player, hopefully in, in kind of terms that they'll, that they'll get. Um, but then it's up to that character, up to that player role-playing that character's intelligence to figure out uh, how the message gets relayed to the rest of the party. Um, and so you can it, it opens up a whole bunch of really interesting roleplay doors if you've got a receptive party to just 
give it to someone who doesn't expect to, to have a prophecy. Line art suggesting, you know, a person standing uh, at the altar at the wrong time, which is an excellent kind of kind of kind of setup for it, right? You have the uh, you have your idiot barbarian or whatever who who happens to be walking through a church, you know, looking for I don't know, maybe he's looking for stuff to steal, uh, but he instead steps next to the altar and wham, vision, vision from he doesn't even know what the deity is, but vision. He must go. I am now on a holy quest. I must climb that hill and like jump off of it or something. Um, it, it, it's a big deal. Um, we're also, so, another guess, another element of good prophecy, good prophecy that we need to add is gravity. It's one thing to make it important, uh, to make a prophecy important because the DM said it, Right, because the DM stopped the whole all the action at the table and said you experienced this vision. Um, but it's another thing to actually make the vision have weight. Uh, let's give an example of a vision I've used. Um, so I quite like the uh, the multiverse and kind of plane hopping uh, as a story trope. It, it's something I've used quite heavily. Uh, well, I'm using quite heavily in uh, here in the Birth of the World campaign. That we're working on, which needs a name, by the way, definitely needs a name. Um, but in my own campaign setting, in Teradahar, we've also got a kind of a non-standard cosmology involving multiple planes, and um, the the vision I, I gave the I gave all the player characters the same vision at the start of the campaign, uh, which goes something like: um, you, you're standing on a salt plane, and you have you have no idea why you're here. You're just having this dream. It's just, you're here. You dream you're standing on a salt plane, like the, the air is stinging your eyes and throat. It's very, very real. But everywhere you look, just horizon to horizon, it's just caked white salt. Uh, and then you start looking up, because there's nothing to see. And you see above you a whole other world above you, like just filling the whole sky. There's another world, and it seems to be almost coming towards you, almost descending down above your head. And as you look up, suddenly you lose your balance and fall backward, and you wake up in your bed. And that's the whole vision right there, and it's a it's a very, very odd vision. Um, as it turns out, um, they were kind of driven to figure out what this means, uh, and it drew it drew them to um, Ceridian, to the to the main scholar city, uh, where they met many many other adventurers who had had this vision. Because what it turned out is one of the demigods from that setting, one of the Hebdomad, Azan, had given this vision to capable adventurers as kind of a call to action explaining that this will be the fate of Prime uh, if you turn down this call to adventure, basically, is Prime will be wiped out, reduced to a flat ball of salt, and then have another plane crash into it. Uh, that's kind of what it is, but it's just as a story hook. It's just, just you don't have to explain the meaning, right? Just wanting to understand the meaning of a vision, if it seems dire enough, uh, can be important. And so that's kind of another important piece about giving visions is, is this this gravity, this this weight that it has to um, it has to really ring with the players that okay, this is this feels important. This feels like something really special and strange is going to happen. And I mean, in my case, everyone had this shared dream, so that also helps reinforce that okay, this is important because it's affecting everyone. Um, So yeah, roleplay considerations for giving it to only one character. Okay, let's talk about let's work on this specific prophecy. Um, we kind of noted early on that it's given as a, given as visions, given as a vision. And so images, no block text, right? We were just giving them this one, uh, we're giving them this vision, this piece of, this one set of scenes, a set of images. Uh, uh, 
let's make it more so so we're gonna have multiple images uh, and let's say again feel free to throw out, ide throw out ideas for how to construct this here but let's say that each image represents kind of the progression of things a step in a progression of things <clears throat> that will happen if the player characters do not act Um, this is important also because this means as soon as the player characters start changing things, we can invalidate this vision altogether. Um, but <coughs> in true storytelling fashion, sorry, I need to take another glass of water here. <coughs> Generally speaking, with prophecy tropes, um, you'll change, you'll have the actions of the players, the actions of the characters change part of the prophecy but maybe something will still happen, but happen in a different way than it appears originally. <coughs> I really should have looked up some more nice classy examples, but I just, no, I never rehearse these things because I like ad-libbing, see previous video. Um, so. Um, so let's come up with a progression of images. What's this series going to be like? Uh, we need to keep it short because it's going to have to be described as block text. So we'll, we'll keep it as four, four scenes, four scenes. Okay. So vision scene one. Uh, let's say this is going to be. Uh, so the first scene should say something about the fact that there are mirrors in multiple places, that they're all active. Um, so we want to show... Scene two. Uh, what message is the second scene trying to say? Um, second scene, we should go into the. So that's one's kind of the present. So two would go into the future now. Uh, we see. Um, badness is spreading. We see maybe an entire town consumed. Let's do a castle. <coughs> Scene three, um, the the there's the the plot that we talked about where there's the two nations that are going to war. So I think maybe we should sh kind of get this across that. Uh, uh, So we see the, the, the so this is just this is ripple effects, right? Now we're talking about so we have the pre scene one's the present, scene two is kind of the the not distant future. Um, scene three kind of goes sideways a bit and just like also this stuff's going to happen uh, if you don't do anything. And finally. Um, So 
destroy the world. How do we how do we say this? We say uh, <coughs> so basically, I mean basically um, the we're turning prime is turning into outland is kind of where this is going. I think. Um, outlandish um, yeah okay so uh, for anyone who's joined in the last half hour or so this is an interactive podcast and I'm probably gonna need uh, your help in chat now to help come up with kind of what these scenes are actually going to be I want to come up with like short like one or two sentences one or two sentence kind of pieces of block text um, for each of the scenes in this vision, and that will be our our prophecy is these four these four visions. Uh, I'm gonna jump on the first one because I think I have a good idea. Uh, let's see. So, so this, this will be the first one, and it's just like, You see a mirror sitting amidst a pile of treasure. Oily black tentacles are stretching outwards through the mirror and slithering along piles of gold. So, so we're, we're, just, we're just showing that there's other mirrors, right? That's all we're trying to say with this message. There's other mirrors in other places. So we have a mirror sitting in a treasure pile. Um... I guess important is we're not explicitly saying that the mirror is the same as the one they saw in the orc cave, but uh, when they stop and think about this afterwards, because this is this is a fairly clear vision, I want to say it's vague but clear, if that makes any sense at all. Um, it's a clear enough vision that we could say oh, we can look back and think about it and say, okay, where else have I seen an interesting mirror? Where else have I seen a mirror that's important? And you'll think about that second adventure where we're just like, oh. It was the same as the mirror in the orc cave that we accidentally touched and did stuff that was magic. So there's that. There, there's scene one. Scene two, um, again, it's kind of described for us almost already by the, by the, the notes we came up with. But uh, So, 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 so I want to do like like the plane of fire is breaking through. Oh, we got, oh, hey, we got a suggestion from chat here. A black spire rising of jungle treetops, adjacent floating spires. The architecture is obtuse and sharp. I like it. It's out of place because it's a big black spire in the middle of a forest. Thank you, line art. I'm just going to steal that right out, outright and just slap it right in here. <coughs> Um, I'm gonna obtuse. Is, uh, I'm gonna say I'm just gonna change alter this slightly actually. The architect. I'm just gonna obtuse is a wonderful word, but uh, it, it it doesn't suit the way I I, I would say it. Uh, 
uh, it doesn't, I like that it flows better this way, I think. A black spire rising out of jungle treetops, adjacent floating spires. A black spire rising out of jungle, free, jungle treetops with adjacent floating spires. And this needs to be a full stop. So there we go. So so we do we do the mirror thing. And we do next. You see a black spire rising out of jungle treetops with adjacent floating spires. The architecture is sharp and alien. Um, I'm going to add. And I'm not. I'm, you spot strange figures moving along the battlements because we want to talk about the creatures coming through a bit. Um, Just that, maybe. Just say, you see a great host arrayed before you, armed and clad for battle. A horn sounds and a charge begins. And just cut away right there. We're not, not even going to show necessarily arm, uh, armies fighting each other. Just just an army riding into battle, basically. Um, I think I like that. And last, lastly, the vision of, of a wrecked world. Um, So, so let, let, let's see let's see how this rolls. <clears throat> so, so we're say let's say we're just let's say we're giving this to the whole party. Um, I still might choose to give it to one character, but uh. <clears throat> you see a mirror sitting amidst a pile of treasure. Oily black tentacles are stretching outwards through the mirror and slithering along piles of gold. Next, you see a black spire rising out of jungle treetops with adjacent floating spires. The architecture is sharp and alien. You spot strange figures moving along the battlements. Following this, you see a great host arrayed before you, armed and clad for battle. A horn sounds and a charge begins. Finally, you see a blasted hellscape. Burning hills crumble into a roiling ocean while black storm clouds writhe overhead. What do we think, chat? I would love some honest opinions. Um, if you're reading this in YouTube comments, feel free to write too. If it's if it's oh, it's a bit overdone, maybe overdone in some areas, undone others. I don't know. We're sussing this out, right? We're, we're still we're, we're still shaking this out. I've still got like half my video left. Um, if people want to suggest things, I get a woo from chat. Okay, uh, we get, we have a lovely scene of like heavy metal album covers um, that we just cycle through here. Um, Let me just do this. That's what we basically got here. We're, we're, we're going through like mega deaths, uh, album covers, or whatever. Uh, let's put this together. 
Okay. So there's our wall of text. That's a good size for a block text, too. Um, so I think that's looking pretty darn nice. <coughs> so one thing we'll have to do, um, I guess another prophecy trope um, is that, the, that it should be possible to find help with the interpretation, right? Um, this is something my own player characters did when I gave them a really obscure vision. Uh, interpretation, yes, okay. Um, so let's talk about that briefly. Um, who could help? We need to come up with a few, and with some NPCs who might be willing to kind of assist the party uh, with this, since we've got, like, I've got some time left in this video, so let's talk about this. Um, open to suggestions again from chat. What do you think? Uh, who, what NPCs should we have available for the player characters to go to to kind of ask for interpretation? Obviously, we've got um, the obvious ones right off the top. We have an old priest, a young priest. Uh, and a uh, scholar of some kind. And yeah, that was a joke that kind of just went flat, but uh, you always need an old priest and a young priest. Uh, so let's say, going back, let's say they're back in, um, let's say they're back in Vrasta since Nassar's kind of fucked up at the time. Um, An old priest. We'll have a priest of like a really traditional, like old traditional sun worship, lawful good sun worshiping kind of religion that has yet to be named. I should do a whole video on religions, shouldn't I? That's another time. I'll do a video on religions sometime. Um, Your, insert your stand-in for Paylor here, um, and we'll talk about what his interpretation is. And we'll also do a priest of other. What's other? What's other? Let's, let's say we, we have like a a um, maybe a chaotic good priest. Yeah, let's do a chaotic good priest. Um, let's do like. I don't want to do like the ultra traditional one. Maybe it would be like an elvish. Yeah, that we'll give that, that. Have them have a thing, and a scholar, which is you know a um, uh, say a wizard of conjuration. Who will probably actually be able to give us the most specific advice because Conjuration is, of course, the school for portals. Um, and you can be your nice, lawful, neutral, I do anything for knowledge kind of person. And maybe we'll flash these NPCs out uh, when we talk about what's going to happen in the next uh, actual story episode uh, of the campaign. But let's just talk about kind of what we can expect the interpretations to be. The old priest will say it's obviously a message from his God. Um, you know, uh, uh, about the dangers of accumulating wealth. Uh, stop stealing. <laughs> I don't know. I, I want this. I want them to be just a couple of completely incorrect interpretations. Um, most, mostly for humor, mostly for something that the, the player characters can laugh at afterwards. Um, stop with the it's about the dangers of accumulating wealth. Uh, so we get we get the topic of overriding right, but just completely missing the actual point. I like I like that. The young priest is going to say. Um, it's the young priest. 
Let's say the young priest is a bit more right. Maybe he focuses more on the second and third uh, visions than the first one. Uh, it heralds a demonic invasion. Uh, uh, something and something with magic mirrors. Or be wary of. Let's say he, he says, you know, we should be wary. Of, which would be excellent advice to give to the player characters, you know, the, the day before or whatever, when they're still in the orc cave and um, before they accidentally activate it. Um, this is another important one here. He's, he's going to go over and say we should prepare for war. Uh, which, which ties in nicely because now this then becomes uh, if they, if they even get this interpretation right this is the you know write twice as much as you're going to actually use uh, rule of DMing but if we actually use this interpretation that gives us another little element that we can say is pushing for war right this pushing for battle in this case maybe it's battle um, between our two neighboring nations that we talked about potentially throwing into conflict. So this, the young priest is prepare for war, but against the wrong opponent. The scholar, I want, I'm going to say, is probably going to know the best about what's going on because he's be the most familiar with kind of magic items. So the scholar would say something to the effect of, of um, these mirrors must be, must be magic of some sort. magic um, he's gonna still kind of he, I don't think he's gonna quite know that these are happening on their own necessarily but uh, we could say He's, uh, so I mean, obviously all three of them, if they, if the party actually recover the mirror from Nassar, which is it's a distinct possibility, um, then they'll have something to say about the magic mirror or something effective, you know, well, this is clearly magic and uh, it's dangerous and we should do something about it. Um, scholars can be no different. He's going to probably want to keep it and study it. Um, Um, but it'll take him several weeks to study it. So this could potentially be an ally who, stay, who stays in Vrasta and can send the party a message saying, hey, I learned this thing about these um, kind of thing. I, I discern something more about the nature of these mirrors. Whereas the priests will probably just want to <clears throat> get rid of the thing or seal it away. Um, depending on how that particular, uh, re how their particular religious guidelines play out. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the wizard's party would have advice for me, maybe, well, go find the lar the biggest, oldest hordes of treasure you can think of and go raid that shit. Right? He's going to tell them to go be RPG heroes and steal treasure uh, wherever they can find it. And I, I really like that. His, his, that's the, the, wizard's, the wizard's message. Um... So those are kind of the bits of a prophecy, how to, how, to, how to do a prophecy. Let's recap here quickly. So uh, you have to have, there's specific bits of information that you must get to the players, whether or not they actually understand them at the time. And it can even be fun for role playing if you give it to a character in a way that they can't understand it right away, but they, they can continue to think about it, continue to piece it together. Um, good prophecies are vague and kind of maybe have more depth than they appear to at first. Um, they're often unexpected, 
they have to have weight that they have to make the player characters on their own without telling them that this is you know grave of the fate of the world type stuff recognize that it's fate of the world type stuff and act accordingly uh, and the characters receiving the prophecy should be able to get some advice uh, based on the interpretation, but that advice doesn't have to be good advice, right? You can give them um, terrible advice, uh, or you can give them tangential or mo mostly correct, but not entirely correct advice. Uh, there, there's many options when dealing with the delivery of prophecy. So we've got our prophecy now, right? Um, while they're fighting, while they are fighting this angel, while they are locked in combat with this angel, like around, let's say around three or something like that, so the angels probably got a little bit of damage on them. The party are going to have things under under control in a round or two, but we want to get this through them first while they're still thinking about fighting. And all of a sudden, we interrupt all the action and say, "All of a sudden, you're somewhere else. You see a mirror sitting amidst a pile of treasure. You're just kind of floating near the ceiling." Uh, oily black tentacles are stretching outwards from the mirror surface and slithering along the piles of gold. Then you're somewhere else again. Next you see a black spire rising out of jungle treetops with adjacent floating spires. The architecture is sharp and alien, but you spot strange fig figures moving along the battlements. Next you see a great host arrayed before you. Again, you're just kind of floating, and uh, you see these hosts, and they're all armed and clad for battle. Suddenly a horn sounds and a charge begins. Uh, just as the charge is starting, you, your vision cuts someplace else. Finally, you see a blasted hellscape. There are burning hills crumbling into a roiling ocean while black storm clouds writhe overhead. And then just like that, you're back in your body, back in the village of Nassar fighting an angel. And then we would continue with turn order. I'm, I'm just like straight up interrupting the action to give this vision and then bam, we're back, the, the turn order is again, hey, you have to go fight this boss and do something about the actual magic mirror in this town. Um, and so the players will be scratching their heads, you know, someone might take notes. Um, if, like, as I suspect, I'm going to give this to one player in particular who is usually the biggest enthusiast for lore uh, in the world and who's most likely to remember the fine details of this. Um, which will help because that way now I've got a player character who's going to help me tell the story. Um, basically who I'm in cahoots with now as a co-author. Uh, it is a little bit putting one player above the others, which is generally a bad thing to do for DMing. But in my particular group, because I'm, I mean, I'm writing this with my group in mind, but I'm putting it out there for other groups to share. Um, with my group in mind, there's one, player character, there's one player in particular who likes to learn the lore and likes to be kind of engrossed in the story, and I want to kind of reward that a little bit, um, but not to the point of kind of taking away from anything else. It just gives me... Rather than having to like drop a DMPC or something like that into the party just to tell the story through, I can have you know, oh, you're the guy with the prophecy, and that's a hook right there. And I don't, I he doesn't have to know anything extra. He doesn't have to have any special information. Um, just he's the guy who gets recognized and things like that. So we'll we'll see where this takes us. Um, now that we've got our prophecy written and delivered, um, so I think that will be it. For tonight's show. I know it gets a slightly shorter show than usual, um, but I'm rather than sitting here rambling for a bit, I think I'll just we'll just call it here. So, um, my name is Rob Hicks, aka Too Many Knives. You can use any this or any of the stuff in my videos uh, under Creative Commons 4.0 Attribution, which means basically you just have to give me a credit and you can use it however you like. Otherwise, uh, I would appreciate it if you give me a tweet uh, when you come to if you actually use any of this in any of your uh, campaign because it means a lot to me and I'll give you a shout out here in the stream. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe and like. Uh, that, I think, is everything. If you're watching on Twitch, uh, please um, heart, please sub please follow, whatever. Um, other than that, yeah, I'll see you guys next week. Have a good night. Bye.